Hey, happy Thursday, Team Biosafe. Thanks for tuning in to another fireside chat with me, Zach the Grow Guy. Uh, I hope everybody's been well the last couple weeks. I apologize I haven't been able to do these. I've uh, just had some other stuff going on, but uh, very happy to be back and, uh, you know, educating you guys on some of the uh, nuances of the game, so to speak. Uh, today's topic is going to be uh, sacred flies, also known as fungus gnats, and uh, basically the best way to mitigate and deal with them, utilizing biosafe products and cultural practices um, so that they become less of a nuisance in the garden. Um, you know, the first thing that I would really recommend looking at with uh, any fungus gnat infestation is going to be, you know, your, your cultural practices. How often are you getting, you know, adequate dry downs? What is the moisture content of your media? Do you completely saturate it? Um, you know, that is going to play directly into, you know, decomposition of your, you know, media or whatever it is. I guess it would be media, uh, the, you know, what you're growing in. When it's wet, it starts to decompose. What do fungus gnats eat? You know, decaying organic material. So your dry downs have a direct correlation on, you know, populations. Being able to, you know, take away that conducive environment and, uh, you know, happy home for them is definitely part of the, uh, you know, three-prong approach of getting rid of them. Um, utilizing BioSafe Zeratol 2.0 or HC, uh, that is a great way to basically, you know, sanitize the media and eliminate the food source for the fungus gnats. Obviously, if, uh, you know, they don't have uh, a food source, they can't stick around. So, you know, by keeping things clean and sterile, you're definitely going to be able to affect the population in that way. Um, you know, removal of debris is also going to be key because, again, they do feed on decaying organic material. So don't have a bunch of, you know, dead leaves and stuff in your trays or in the tops of your pots because that is going to increase the likelihood that they're going to be around. Um, and to kind of go back just a little bit about the, you know, dry down period, uh, fungus gnats like to kind of hang out where Pythium may be. And if you see one, you may have the other. They're not necessarily always together, but it's almost kind of like peanut butter and jelly. Most of the time, if you see one, the other one's there in some level. By utilizing the Xeratol, uh, you are going to be able to you know, address any pythium symptoms you may encounter while at the same time taking away the food source for those fungus gnats. So it is really kind of a one-two punch with that product, keeping things nice and uh, sterile and, uh, you know, just eliminating that conducive environment quotient of it. Um, the implementation of sticky cards and diatomaceous earth is also very effective for fungus gnats. Uh, I'd, I'd like those to be used in conjunction with active uh, or mobile pesticides, because we've got mobile and immobile. Uh, your diatomaceous earth and sticky cards are going to be immobile because of the fact that they're just kind of there all the time. They don't really have... The insect has to come across it for it to be effective, whereas an active insecticide is going to be something like Azagard or BioSeries. It's going to target those insects and be able to get them whether they are running or not. Um, the... Other thing that uh, a lot of growers have found to be very beneficial is the implementation of nematodes in conjunction with the Azagard and BioSeries. Uh, the Steiner Neba Felte are very effective against fungus gnat larvae, so you know incorporating them into a drench process is not that hard to do. Um, but going after uh, the gnats with the Azagard, we're gonna you know hit them with that. They're going to have that anti-feeding quality imparted into them. So Xeratol takes away the food source. Azagard's going to make them not want to eat anyway, so they're going to be severely weakened. We're going to affect their ability to molt. Uh, so we you know, are going to reduce the population because if they can't get to that adult end star stage, they're not able to procreate. And you know, the ovicidal properties uh, also definitely play uh, into that so that they're not able to have larvae that hatch. Um, the BioSeries WP really is going to be the culmination of the approach. Uh, it is an entomopathogenic soil-borne fungus that's very effective against soft-bodied insects, such as fungus gnats, but uh, will also target things like root aphid. So, you know, being able to have a product that's going to, you know, provide you more than one level of control is definitely going to be to your benefit. 
Uh, I see some of the questions, guys. I'll scroll through at the end and get them all answered. Uh, I'm just going to get through the fungus gnat thing first, and then uh, I'll answer each and individual one. Uh, again, the approach of taking away the food source, messing with their ability to molt, and then hitting them with that entomopathogenic fungus, coupled with your immobile pesticides, will allow you to get rid of this infestation that a lot of growers have encountered. Um, the last two things I'm going to say before I answer all the questions is uh, the fungus gnat and root aphid have the ability to kind of, you know, hang out with one another. And there are a lot of growers that will look at their sticky cards and they don't necessarily know, am I looking at a fungus gnat or a root aphid here? The easiest way to really identify them without getting into scientific classification is uh, a fungus gnat is going to have a very defined abdomen and thorax. You can definitely see where their chest stop or you know, basically stops and then the rest of their body begins. And their wingspan is going to be basically perpendicular with their body length. It's, it's going to be that same length. Whereas with a root aphid, you're going to have a bulbous insect that's going to have a wingspan that is much larger than you know its body length and so that's just the easiest way to identify the two is like can you see does it look sleek or bulbous and how long are the wings that way you know if you're dealing with either fungus gnats or root aphids all right guys let me uh, go through here and i will answer the questions that were presented thank you all for tuning in again and uh, i hope you guys are all having a wonderful thursday uh Cultivar Hunter is saying how many mils per gallon for a root drench. Uh, so for the Zeratol, I would almost recommend doing like a sprench application where you're just spraying the tops of the containers. Unless you do have a root-borne disease, then uh, depending on your media, you're going to go anywhere from a 1 to 100 to a 1 to 250 as a curative approach. And then if, uh, you know, the idea is to keep uh, more pathogens at bay, we would go to a water treatment rate at that point or move to a spray application just to keep, uh, you know, algae from growing on the tops of the containers and taking away the food source. Uh, for the Azagard, you would want to use 4 ml per gallon to target them. Again, in a sprench application because you are going to have flyers that are going to be moving around and you want to be able to target every single stage of their life cycle. And uh, with the BioSeries WP, you want to use between 7 to 9 grams per gallon. And again, sprench mode where you're hitting the canopy as well as the root ball because we want to make sure that we are touching anywhere they could possibly be. All right. Um, Shatter Boston was asking mils per gallon for Zeratol drench. Uh, again, 1 to 100 to 1 to 250 depending on your media as an initial curative rate for disease. Uh, we would use it at like 1.2 mils per gallon as like a water treatment application. So if the idea is to remove the food source before it even gets to the media, you know, we'll treat your filamentous algae, your cyanobacteria, your zoospore with that water treatment rate. If it never makes it through the water column to the media in the first place, then that's, you know, being proactive versus reactive. And I advocate water treatment whenever possible. Execute was saying, what's the average cost to start using your products? Um, execute, what I can tell you is uh, our products are priced for farmers. We don't put the cannabis tax on our uh, you know, chemistries like a lot of other people do. Uh, you're going to pay the same amount as a poinsettia grower, as a potato grower, as a you know, hobby grower. Every, we consider everybody on team biosafe you know our team and we want to make sure that nobody has any unfair advantages and we try to make it so that everybody can uh, you know grow ethically and cleanly and some of our professional products can also be purchased in retail sizes so you know for example if you don't need a two and a half gallon of uh, you know Zeratol 2.0 you can always go and get like a one gallon of Zeratol HC um, if you don't need a two and a half gallon of our you know herbicide that's uh, organic certified, you know, good for mitigating invasive plants. Uh, we do have, you know, retail versions of that as well. So we, we try to be able to allow you guys to, you know, fit it in wherever you can. But uh, we can, you know, do everything from helping you keep your house clean to making sure your plants have that same luxury. Uh, Terps filled the room, said, came in a little late. What's the name of the product you were talking about using for aphids and gnats? Never mind answering it now. Awesome. Uh, again, that's BioSeries, WP, and Azagard. 
Uh, second to none. What is the correct mils per gallon for Zeratol foliar? Had a lot of burn when using it. Uh, the fire hose or pre-harvest rate, second to none, would be 37 mils per gallon. Uh, that's if you see a active, you know, heavy disease pressure situation or if, uh, you know, you're basically trying to address any microbial contamination before chop. Uh, as a maintenance rate, you want to use 15 milliliters per gallon. I'm willing to bet that you maybe mixed it with RO water when you did your spray. Uh, we advocate using tap water because of the fact that you need a little bit of bicarbonate content in your water source to off put that PAA so that your pH doesn't bottom out right away. Um, RO water obviously comes out of the machine at 7.0, but after 24 hours through oxidation, it's going to be at a pH of 5.5 and with no ability to you know, buffer an acid, when you add Zeratol to it, it can drop it as low as 3. And so, you know, what do growers do when they have extremely low pH? Well, they add potassium hydroxide back in there, and by mixing that acid and, you know, that base with zero interaction with bicarbonate content, you basically render the Zeratol much less effective, and it's not going to do what you're trying to do. So in a situation uh, where... You know, let's say your tap water is complete garbage. Mix up maybe like a tenth to a third strength NPK. Then add your Zeratol just so that you do have some bicarbonate content to the water. Uh, potassium bicarbonate is a decent way to do so, just to add a little buffer to it. But uh, as long as the pH is, I would say, 5 to 7, just let it ride. Uh, Bun Badman is saying, can I do that with the HC? Uh, of course you can. The, uh, the Zeratol 2.0 and HC are very uh, similar formulas, and the applications are going to be universal in terms of sprays, sprenches, uh, water treatment, uh, you know, root drenches, cleaning your uh, tables and trays, your pots, what have you. Uh, is there anything Zeratol 2.0 can do, HC can do as well. Let's see. Uh, Cultivar Hunter is saying, can you mix BioSeries and Zeratol in a spray drench, or does that counteract the BioSeries efficacy? Uh, you definitely would not want to mix them together. Uh, the Zeratol obviously is a, you know, sanitizer, and by putting a fungal spore in there, because it is a fungicide, we would just be rendering both products inert. Uh, typically, I recommend trying to do, like, Azagard and Zeratol on, like, a Monday, and then doing your bio series on like a Wednesday, playing off of the uh, anti-feedant, growth regulant, and ovocidal qualities of the Azagard, the bio series application is going to be that much more effective because we're, we're kind of kicking them while they're down, in essence, if that makes sense. Michigan Medical said, Azagard for the win. Hey, thanks. You know, we, uh, we do what we can, and uh, it's the only formulation that's made here in the U.S., so uh, you guys know that you're supporting... Uh, an American business when uh, you buy our product. Execute said, uh, you can dip clones in that as a guard to prevent anything. Typically, uh, what I recommend execute is spray the as a guard before you take your clones. Um, if you're going to dip in anything, typically I recommend Zeratol just to be able to sanitize the cutting. But any terms of pesticides or, uh, you know, even some fungicides, try to spray it on the mother plant so that you're not imparting extra stress into that clone. Because once you cut it off that main plant, the only thing it's going to focus on is trying to heal itself. And, you know, phytotoxicity is a much more likely scenario if the plant is weak. And so by doing it ahead of time and, you know, kind of inoculating the plant before you take your cuttings, you're going to see less stress to those cuttings. They're going to root faster and they're going to allow you to keep your cycle moving in a more efficient way. Uh, e Rebel is saying, what's best for a soil drench for aphids? Uh, if we're talking root aphids, again, I recommend doing a sprench after an irrigation, uh, starting with the Azagard so that we can affect their life cycle, you know, basically reduce their ability to lay viable eggs, reduce their ability to get to that end star stage so that they're not procreating, and then following up with, uh, you know, like the bio series, maybe rotating in like the, uh, Burkle Dura, that's the uh, Venerate, I believe. Um, and then playing like a Paleomyces Formosius, which is like a PFR 97. Rotating those out with your microbials, you're going to have a much 
more successful time being able to target all those insects because in any population there are going to be certain individuals that are resistant to certain things and so by doing that rotation we can ensure that resistance isn't developed and that we're targeting as many of those uh, you know outliers as possible but uh, you know doing the sprench after the irrigation the me methodology behind that is that they run away from the water the first time they see it you wait 30, 45 minutes after your irrigation so that they go back to work, you know, they go back to eating, they get complacent. You follow up with that pesticide, you're much more likely to have contact with those insects because of the fact that they are not trying to just, you know, evade you at that point. We're, uh, we're able to target them effectively. Uh, Ken Phillip is saying, can Xeritol 2.0 and HC be used at the same rate? Uh, yes, can we recommend uh, basically the same applications for both? So, you know, 1 to 100 for pre harvest is for 2.0 as well as HC. Uh, 1 to 250 would be the maintenance rate for 2.0 as well as HC. Uh, Execute is saying sometimes he gets clones from other people. Um, Execute, I, uh, I put together an article on uh, Ethos Genetics website. Uh, I'd ask you to possibly check that out. It's, it's a whole you know, protocol on basically how to bring in new genetics to a facility. And uh, the, the long and the, the short of it is, yes, you could dip them in Azagard at that point, um, but it's going to be more of a quarantine process than just like dipping it and hoping things work out. I recommend setting up a tent as far away from everything else as possible. You know, basically isolating that, making sure that's the last room that you go in into the day so that there is no risk of cross-contamination. You know, pay attention to those plants for two weeks, three weeks, till you can get viable clones off of those. Cut your clones, move that to a secondary quarantine that's still away from your main grow and watch those for another two weeks to make sure that there's nothing on them. And then those clones are the clones that can be, you know, basically integrated into production. But uh, if it was me, I would never take a clone that someone gave me directly and put it into my garden. I'm going to take clones of that clone that I know are clean. Um, but again, that article on Ethos will definitely uh, go into more detail if you're interested. Second to none is asking for what for clone dipping. What rate should I use? Uh, 15 ml is what we recommend. So that one to 250. And again, no RO water. Make sure you guys are using tap. Uh, Shane Gaelic is saying has BioSafe tested or trialed products to see if the degradation of trichomes with hydrogen peroxide. Um, what we found, Shane, is that cannabis is a lot like a rose. If you are going to you know take roses that have been cut and there's no osmotic pressure there anymore and you put them in the sink and you get a petal wet you get that petal burn um it's, it's very similar in terms of like how h2o2 and paa will affect cannabis if you're doing a dunk after the fact and we're talking you know the plant doesn't have processes going on anymore that's where you see the degradation occur just like if you had that rose bush in your backyard, you could have your center pivot sprinkler going off and the flowers can get wet and because they're still attached, you don't get that same petal burn. So uh, basically try to, you know, treat your plants while they are still growing. Um, that will ensure that, you know, you're never accused of trying to do something unethical like cheating a sample. If you were dunking after the fact, they could say, did you do this to the you know, entire crop the exact same way. And that's a much harder process to achieve because you have to monitor your level of PAA. Every time you do a dunk, you're going to be degrading your sanitation level. Whereas if you do a spray ahead of time, you're going to be cutting down a sanitized crop. So you also lower the, you know, potential for yeast mold and something like botrytis to uh, find its way in and potentially ruin your cure. Uh... Roni is saying, what's the difference between Xeritol HC and 2.0? Uh, the main difference is just going to be who the end user is going to be. 2.0 is a professional product that's designed for, you know, production on scale. HC is going to be geared more towards, you know, smaller gardens, home gardens, and, uh, you know, just folks that maybe wouldn't want to have a 2.5 of Xeritol sitting around for 
the next 10 years. But uh, we, again, we just we try to be able to cater to any aspect where you guys just want clean chemistry in your lives. Uh, Execute is asking ethosgenetics.com. Uh, yes, I believe so. If, if you Google ethos genetics, it's the first thing that comes up. And then they've got a, an educational tab section thing. And uh, again, the article is uh, quarantining and introducing new plants into a facility. Uh, no RO for anything, guys. Like anytime you're going to use Xeratol, tap or if you have to use ro because your tap is crap we have to add some bicarbonate back to it so remember we do a little bit of base mpk or some potassium bicarbonate so that that ph does not bottom out uh terps fill the room says how long is average se shelf life if you did stock up um, most products man are going to last 12 to 18 months when stored properly and, uh, you know, a good metric for you to be able to figure out how much you need is a gallon of solution, for the most part, will cover about 400 square feet at a 12-inch canopy depth. So you can do the math from there in terms of how many gallons of solution you're going to need to run through, how many sprays you're going to do, and then you're able to, you know, basically amorate out that cost and say, okay, this quart of Azagard is going to last me six months, or this quart of Azagard is going to last me two weeks and at which point you might want to buy a gallon so that you don't run out and miss a day. But, uh, that being said, anytime you guys have, uh, you know, more shit than shovel, so to speak, just go to the next day on the schedule, keep working, forget that, you know, yesterday's the past. We can't change that. But if we try to do yesterday's stuff today, then we put today's stuff off until tomorrow. And then that snowball just gets exponentially bigger and keeps rolling down the hill. So, uh, you know, try to stay on the uh, program as much as you guys can. But uh, we're all human and we all make mistakes. And if you miss a day, just try to do better tomorrow. Uh, I think I got all the questions, guys. If there are any more, throw them out now. Sweet. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. And... Uh, Anybody that's going to uh, the NOCO Hemp Expo tomorrow, I'll see you there. Uh, Manny D is saying, our DWC system, clean and sanitize after a run. Uh, it's a two-step process, Manny. Uh, recommend doing the Green Clean Acid Cleaner first. It is a sulfuric acid-based uh, step one, basically. And what happens is it works like sandpaper inside your system and roughs up all the deposits so that you are able to break them loose. Uh, basically, you run that at 1 to 100, 1 to 2 hours, flush your system with two times the amount of clear water that it holds. So if it's a 10-gallon system, you flush 20 gallons, fill it back up with Sanidate 5.0 at 1 to 100, 37 mils in a gallon. Let that sit for a minimum of three hours, but if you can let it run overnight, that's the best bang for your buck. Next day, again, two times the amount of clear water the system holds. Put your net pots back in, and uh, you're as close to clean as you're going to get, man. Um, that's what we recommend for DWC systems, NFT systems, and drip line cleaning. Uh, second to none is saying, can we fog Xeratol late in flower? Uh, yes, sir, you can. Uh, I have a lot of growers that will actually do a pre-harvest Xeratol treatment to address any microbial concerns that, you know, could arise. That 1 to 100 rate is very effective against yeast, mold, and fungi. And the coolest thing about Xeratol is that it is a zero residual chemistry. So even if you use it in late flower, it breaks down into oxygen and water. There's nothing there that's going to be imparted into your plant that's going to affect your taste, flavor, or potency. So it is a very good option for growers that want to make sure they're cutting down the cleanest product possible. Um, you know, perfect scenario. Your trimmers get there at 10 o'clock. Make sure your guy's done by 9 so that one hour REI can elapse and they go in there and cut down a sanitized crop. Uh, you know, any other type of farmer would have to do just that to ensure that their products would be able to, uh, you know, pass human health pathogen testing in a grocery store. It's no different than, you know, a tomato grower or an apple grower disinfecting their crop from the field to the store. So, you know, if you approach it with the mentality of you're just trying to produce clean cannabis, it definitely makes sense. All right, guys. Well, if uh, anything else comes up, 
feel free to hit my DM, the BioSafe main DM. Um, if there's something you want me to cover, let me know, and I'll get it taken care of. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week.